<laughs> um, he's been with Aravac about what, three and a half, four? Four? About three and a half years. Yeah. Three and a half years. I'm coming up on my three years. Um, do you have much experience with RSI event management? Not a lot, no. <laughs> have you touched the drugs for RSI? Yes, I have. And you know where the box is? Yes, and where the box is. Which I hear that's trying to change so you don't want to put it in the fixes. Yeah. So. Yeah, I didn't know, were they putting it in the fixes? No. Well, because of... It's always been in the fridge. Yeah, it's always been in the fridge, fridge in that little extra but, room. But, but because of the sucks, Julie was just telling me that it might have, it would have to go in the fixes because it's refrigerated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but sucks goes 30 it. days, rock goes, or six, three months, rocks is uh, two months. So okay. um, we had that discussion. So hopefully it'll be just left out and you guys just waste minutes like we waste minutes. Mm -hmm. So we should just keep it in the... We just need to keep that little fridge in the med room and mm -hmm. keep it in there, but I'll mention it to Julie. Yeah, well, she's trying to get rid of the fridge. Why? I just talked to her this morning. Take it up. Okay. Yeah. We need to be able to get to it quicker. <laughs> yes, she wants yeah, to keep it out. That's, that's why she's good. trying to decide, yeah. like, what to do with it. Because mm -hmm. at some point, I probably will take, like, a bar of that fixes. Yeah, I know, it's terrible. It's fun, but... <laughs> um, so, if any of you guys haven't been to any of our presentations, we like to have, like, a back-and-forth conversation about things. I know in some classes that I've taken, I'm like, oh, y'all should not, like, They'll be like, oh, you, you should know it. And I'm like, hey, I don't think I know that. So if that ever happens, be like, speak up. Let us know. We don't care. We want to have the conversation. We're here for your education. Um, no such thing as a stupid question. If you've got, like, some input on something, we've all got our experiences through practice, uh, speak up. We'll talk about it. Um, this isn't going to be death by PowerPoint just because we want you to get hands on the meds. And we've got your cheat sheets on here, and we're gonna talk about them. We're gonna go over them, we're gonna look at your meds, we're gonna look at how your RSI box is set up. And then when we move on to the vent, we're gonna actually put the vent because are you allowed to touch the vent really? No. Exactly. <laughs> we're in a safe space here, and so we're gonna play with it and talk about alarms and how you can do different things to manage alarms. Yeah, There's, you might be able to fix those hit things before, before respiratory. While calling respiratory, just hit the silence before respiratory. I think it even says in there, don't hit the silence button. It does. <laughs> Don't hit the silence button. No. But fix what you can. Right? Yeah, pressure, no pressure. Respirators have their specialty. You guys have your specialty. Hey, well, I'm in. All right. Let me turn the room. Just getting started. Mary, do you know Clyde? I do not. This Hi. is Clyde. This Mary. is Mary. <laughs> nice to meet you. I'm Clyde. How are you? Nice to meet you. Sorry, it's in my cheek. <laughs> So we're going to go over just a quick anatomy review of the airway. We're going to talk about alveolar and pulmonary ventilation and discuss, discuss inclusion and exclusion criteria for RSI. So that's pretty straightforward in the hospital setting. It's not as straightforward for pre-hospital. Um, if you want, we can talk a little bit about that. If you wonder why they might not have intubated in route or why they did intubate in route. Um, the seven P's of RSI and pharmacology and give you some assessment tools to help assess whether you might have a difficult airway or not. Yeah, the pharmacology is going to be hospital specific to what you guys do for your mm -hmm. um, your criteria. No problem. All right. So, everybody familiar with this illustration? Seen a few times. <laughs> Seen it a few times, right? So, we're going to get into a little more in depth of one. Do you want to say something about Yeah, just the the kind of the things we worry about the most, and it'll, it'll um, once we kind of talk through our um, our process of how to assess for a difficult intubation, is the tongue and the epiglottis. Um, those are the things that always cause problems. And if, they, if the doctors here use a glidescope, um, be familiar with the anatomy, um, saying, "Hey, doc, that's that's the spot right there," or "That's not the spot." Um, that's going to be very helpful because everyone's busy, everyone's ramped up during these procedures, um, and having more eyes on the anatomy of proper placement is very, very good. Yeah, you guys do have a big screen for the glide scope. Um, we just have a handheld, and so, I mean, we can both see if we're close, but it's a little more difficult. I forgot Travis rang me coffee, sorry. <laughs> okay, so here's a diagram of the lungs and how we do gas exchange. Um, we want those alveoli to be able to hit our capillary beds and where we come into problems with people that have sick lungs is these alveoli or even like your CHFers, things like that. It gets filled with different things and then they can't make good contact on your capillary beds and then you don't have good gas exchange. And that's why we use a very lovely tool. Do you guys know what we like to use to help with recruitment? Peep. Peep, peep, peep. 
I was like, a tool? Yeah, a tool? Lots of paint. I'm like, is there a spelometer? We're a little too late for that already. It's amazing. Speaking of peeps, do you guys at BBMs have peep belts on them? I don't think so. No. Okay, just uh, just when they get on the ventilator, they can utilize that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but you can add a peep belt. Don't our, um, we got peep belts. Don't our NRP, uh, or like baby ones have peep belts on them? Mm -hmm. Ooh, they do, something. and they usually have a manometer. And then the order. pressure you're actually giving mm -hmm. those kids. Yeah. That's what that. Yeah. Um, if you don't have a peep valve in the, uh, like if you're not using them, educate, educate, educate. Um, we'll talk a little bit more on the preparation steps about why we like to use peep and things like that, because um, that might be your only saving grace to keep your patient afloat while you're intubating. That's what a healthy one looks like. You won't see that. You won't see that. It'll be covered in puke and blood. Oh. Um, did any of you guys get to look at like a COVID intubation on the screen at all? Those epiglottises and things like that look almost like a epiglottitis airway. They're very red. They're very mushroomy looking. Yeah. Like, um, I saw one where even the focal cords look like a, like a cherry pit. Or like a cherry that had been split in the middle, and it's like this is going to be a difficult one. And it, uh, yeah, it took took a couple passes in the smaller tube than uh, necessary, but hopefully we're on the back end of that. Yeah, and so and I know you guys started using eye gels instead of um, peeing airways and things I like that. I don't know if we, I've ever seen one even used yet. Oh, they're marvelous. They're a great rescue airway. Yeah, we can do an eye gel class if you want. Um, but it sits right on this, just looks just like this. Have you guys even looked at them, played with yeah. them, messed with them? Yeah. They've actually molded those to cadaver airways. That's why they look and fit the way they do. Mm -hmm. um, and they just seat right on there. That's why um, you've got to be careful if you've got like a real, like you've got a lot of secretions or a bloody airway or the guy, person's vomiting a lot because it won't seat, it won't mold to um, the epiglottis well. And that's a, would be it. A reason to intubate rather rather than using an eye gel. Go ahead, Kai. Uh, all right. So, the respiratory cycle. Um, when we breathe in, as we're all doing right now, that's an active process. So our intercostal muscles are um, flexing. Our diaphragm is moving down. That's causing a pressure gradient. So the pressure out here versus the pressure that we're creating in that lungs or that negative space causes air to come in. As we exhale, everything relaxes everything kind of goes back to normal that's causing a pressure gradient to push air out so we want to bring oxygen in um, again diffusion across a higher to lower level so there's more oxygen um, in the air than what we're than what our bodies use that's why we're breathing that out and then there's more co2 inside our body than what is in the ambient air so there's a change of diffusion across the um, across the capillary beds and that's how we're going to basically do that gas exchange so natural breathing is that negative pressure, like I said, and anytime we are assisting any patients with their breath, um, it's called positive pressure ventilation. So um, there's things that can kind of have an effect on that. Anytime you're bagging somebody or they're intubated and they're on a ventilator, that's gonna um, do some other things in that intrathoracic space, um, you know, potentially with blood pressure issues and things like that. So those are things we want to kind of be aware of um, so you can mitigate that. So, you know, you always wanna think a couple steps ahead in your, in your patient care. So if you're breathing for somebody, just think about um, those type of things. Oh, oh okay. Sure. Um, so Tina already alluded to this, the gas exchange uh, between the alveoli and the external environment. Um, it's, um, it's just that, that change in pressure. So um, you have your um, alveoli here and uh, all the little uh, uh, blood vessels that surround that. Um, if anything causes this space, to get wider, like CHF, uh, asthma, um, pulmonary edema, things like that. That's Arts. gonna, what's that? Arts. Arts. Yeah, that's gonna inhibit that gas exchange. So um, that's why respiratory therapy is an associate degree program, because they're very good at this stuff. Um, but um, we can also be very good at this in our management of patients. Um, but specifically with ARDS, we wanna try to avoid ARDS, so we do some different things to kind of keep that inflammatory process from building up. Um, if someone's got, you know, really crappy lungs and we want to use that peep like we were talking about, um, that's going to basically make this alveoli bigger, stretch it out, 
Um, that's a twofold uh, assistance because what it does is it's going to make the surface area of that alveoli bigger to allow more gas in and out. It's also going to thin out that uh, membrane between the capillaries and the alveoli to assist with that gas exchange. So the whole end goal of what we do with this stuff is to get down to here. It doesn't matter what's going up here or here, as long as you can move gas in and out, it needs to get down to those uh, alveoli. All right, so pre-hospital has a long list of inclusion criteria for intubation. Here, what are some things, like you look at a patient, you're like, yeah, I'm tubing that patient. Like, I'm gonna start prepping for it. Respiratory rate. Respiratory rate, lots of work, lots of effort. Oxygen saturation. Oxygen saturation. Um, how about your brain, your head injuries? Mm. Like not protecting your not airway. protecting their airway. Their GCS might be down. Mm -hmm. They might be vomiting, 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 and not being able to protect that. Um, you know, they might be breathing okay and saturating okay, but they're might have some type of spinal cord injury, and they're posturing, and you got to take their airway. Mm -hmm. um, so, or their blood gases are terrible. Yeah. Terrible. Yeah. yeah. And you're like, well, yeah. oh, you're you're doing okay, but the blood gas yeah. is oh, saying yeah. that you're going to be impending respiratory failure. And so it's much different from pre-hospital to hospital because in the hospital you're like, oh, I'm going to take the airway. It's to they're like, oh, do I fit this? Yeah. Exclusion criteria. What are some reasons why we might not intubate? Trauma. Trauma. Mm -hmm. yeah, you can't identify the anatomy. Yeah. Trauma. Um, and you might, in an anaphylaxis, you might have lost your airway and now you have to cry. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Is there a story behind that? <laughs> <laughs> I think if you guys have anything to add to this stuff that's happened to you in the past, please include it because it's very helpful to have that, no, that conversation. Yes, we don't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> this is your. So, the seven P's of RSI. All right, I'm going to ask you guys two, two questions. There's no right, wrong answer. There's no trick question. What's RSI stand for? And what's the most important part about the RSA process? Rapid. No, yeah, right. rapid. Intubation. <laughs> yeah. So I challenge you guys to change your mindset on that. All right? RSI, it does stand for rapid sequence induction and rapid sequence intubation. But I, you guys, as the, as the nursing staff here, think about it as resuscitation supersedes intubation. Because everything we do before the tube is more important than the tube. Yeah. The tube is secondary. Everybody gets wrapped around this but we want to make sure the patient survives this yeah. right so that's where you guys come in you guys are going to be doing more things the doctor is going to be focused on drug dosages you know equipment what he or she needs but you guys and girls are going to be the people that keep that patient alive through this so um the you want to get all the tools together we call it a kit dump in the field you want to get all of our stuff out we pre-oxygenate our patient, um, we'll explain that a little bit. Pre-treatment, uh, as far as that goes, um, that's gonna be like your resuscitation efforts. Um, positioning, uh, we're gonna show some slides on that, how you can um, have a better chance of uh, first pass success. Um, excuse me, paralysis with induction, you're gonna push your meds, um, place in the tube, it's that far down, only because it's like the you know, chronological order, but all the stuff above that is more important. And then post-intubation uh, management, which is my giant soapbox and my mountain that I'll die on, uh, because I'm very passionate about what we do after we tube our patients. So for preparation, um, you really need to ask yourself, like, do we really need to perform this? Risk versus reward. Um, <laughs> as nurses, you're not the final say in it, but you are your patient's advocate at this point. If this patient is on the table, on the table to being intubated, you are their advocate. You're their last person to speak up for them. Do they need it? Do they not need it? If I take their airway, am I going to be able to give something back to them if I can't get the tube? Um, do I have the right eye gel set out? Do I have a crike kit set out? Do I have everything that, do I have a VVM ready to go that when we don't get the, the tube in that we can VVM them and keep them oxygenating appropriately? Um, don't be afraid to advocate for your patients in these scenarios. Do a head to toe assessment. You're going to uh, assess it for potential difficult airways, and we'll give you some assessment tools for that. You, IVs, you two would be great. Sometimes you don't got two. <laughs> and your monitor, pulse ox, end title, and history. 
I know this hospital is not very diligent in using a title, but it is the gold standard and it will tell you your patient is crashing a lot faster than if a pulse ox was. Do you guys know how quickly an end title changes? Very Pretty quickly. Quick. <laughs> Real time. Do you guys know how quickly a pulse ox changes? Minutes. Minutes. minutes or five. Like four minutes to start reflecting. So your end title will already be crashing and then your pulse ox will be changing and you're looking at your pulse ox and your patient's already in the toilet. So end title is a great tool to be used. Um, and then you're going to get your ET tube sizes out, size above, size below, 10 cc, syringe, tube holder, etc. Do you guys know the most common tube sizes? Seven, seven and a half. Seven, seven and a half. Perfect. Most um, suction. We use a salad technique. We always leave with suction. Um, airways are yucky and full <laughs> of crud. Um, oh, if they're not full of crud, they will be full of crud. Um, if you miss the tube and they start waking up after your paralysis and induction agents, they will start to vomit nine times out of 10. Um, so leave with that suction. If you, I think they ordered a Ducanto um, oh, cool. uh, suction, and that's really nice because it's got a wider opening in the end, so you can actually stick that in your airway. You can suction, stick at that in your airway, go in with a bougie, and then just use it as a tube exchanger, yeah. basically, and pull your suction out of your tube. Cool and then everything's out. Um, and I think Maggie did order some of those after we talked. Oh, that's really cool. The last time, I don't know if they're being utilized. They look a little different. Well, I mean, we didn't. I didn't know we had them, did you? So yeah, they, they look a little down. different. They're really just like a like wide, wide, wide diameter the whole way down. They'll get chunks. And so, <laughs> yeah. What is, what is salad technique? I'm not familiar with that acronym. So that stands for Suction Assisted Laryngeal Airway Decontamination. Oh. <laughs> 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 so basically, uh, like Tina's saying, you know, we always leave with suction. So when you, if you like YouTube it, you um, you can um, you'll take your your blade and you'll kind of go in and you'll you'll decontaminate the airway as you kind of walk your blade okay. down. And then um, Dr. Ducanto, the one who invented the Ducanto catheter and this technique, he basically brings the the suction over and sticks it in the esophagus yeah. and leaves it running. That's so cool. that way, if any aspirate comes up. That it's suction's there and it just whack, 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 and it sucks it right out of the way. Um, the the way that Tina's talking about is a, a, a different it's technique, which is super down. awesome. Yeah. And it's basically, it's essentially the same thing. It's just catching any aspirate that may go down into the uh, trach and suctioning it out. And then it's um, it's just another um, adjunct, basically, of um, cool. getting that tube in the right place oh, first time. I like it. Very cool stuff, because like, like I said, airways are gross, people vomit. You can it, once that um, view is blocked, and everybody gets spun up because mm -hmm. now all of a sudden your your anatomy's lost, your landmarks are lost, and your patient's going to be sad, and everyone's like, "Oh my gosh, we got to do something now." Yeah. But it can be mitigated with proper preparation. So we talked about alternative and surgical airways, and make sure that your medications are drawn up, cross-checked, and labeled. Um, we do a two-person check always on all medications. That's our policy, um, but it is a good habit to get into if you're using any high risk medications, critical medications to double check those. It's easy to make those mistakes. And remember it's a team effort. Um, doing this alone is going to be awesome. really it is possible but really stressful. Yeah. It's stressful enough doing it at, with your teammates. These are the assessment tools that we talked about. This is uh, the lemons for a difficult airway. So you're just going to look for anything outside or in your Tongue, mustache, beards, mustache. traumas, anything like that <laughs> that might pose for problems. Um, the 332 rule, is anybody familiar with that? Mm -hmm. So that's to tell you how like far, like if you have an anterior airway, which makes it a little bit harder for an intubation. So how many, like three fingers is good in the mouth, how wide the mouth opens, how if you can get three fingers from their chin to their neck, that's also good, and then the two to your cricoid. Um, if any of those are shortened, the more anterior the airway is. Okay. And there's just a slide that um, illustrates that a little better. And then the mouth body <laughs> instantly. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty embarrassing. Ask you, open your mouth so I can assess your mouth. Yeah. Or, uh, I'm doing a stroke assessment. Stick your out your tongue. <laughs> Don't fight me. <laughs> so the mouth body, we have slides on any type of instructions, obstructions. Sorry. Um, 
will make it more difficult, obviously. And then the neck mobility, do they have a neck? Mm -hmm. You know, are they these little short neckers? Um, well, you see collar, when you can't yeah. get them in a proper position, you know, you bring in a trauma and they have that, they're, they're on a spine board, you can't do that proper placement. So that's one yeah. of the things that we deal with in the field. You know. Dentures, check. Pull, yeah, take them out. Pull them out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've been in quite a few intubations where they've been they so quick and then suddenly you're tuning the patient and their teeth are falling out in the middle of your field and you're like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> So this is the lemons. This is um, the 332 method, and it shows you how it is, and you can just see the airway in there. Um, this is the Malin potty score. Basically, it's how much of the opening in the back of the mouth you can see um, to uh, evaluate how big that tongue is and if it's going to be in the way. The more you can see, the better. This will be like your asthmatic patients or you know patients that have like angioedema or something like that. We all want to see this, but more often you'll see like. Pre-oxygenate, nasal cannula at 15 liters, and a non-rebreather or a BVM at 25 with a deep valve. Um, when bagging one, one person can hold the seal and one person can ventilate is ideal. Uh, all of us females, especially in this room, probably will not get a good seal and be able to bag at the same time. It's it's, it's hard, hard to, hard to do. Shaquille O'Neal with his massive hands, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Sealing and bagging at the same time, it's, it's, mm -hmm. you're going to get in the kitchen. So. Especially if you've got somebody that's not holding their airway open, to have a second person on the BBM to hold the jaw and pull it up and get good seal is ideal. Um, you're in pre to four to five minutes, a vital capacity breast. This facilitates the nitrogen washout and prolongs hypoxia during paralysis. So it washes out the nitrogen and it allows your oxygen to stay higher longer. Um, it's been proven, there's lots of studies on it. Um, it's vital to setting yourself up for first pass success um, because once our, your patient desaturates you're starting over uh, so pre-oxygenate appropriately the peak valve helps with the alveolar recruitment and so when you're getting all this recruitment and we do this in our airway we'll hook it up with peep and without peep on a set of lungs and you can see what pre-oxygenation does without a peep valve and then you put a peep valve on it and your lungs start to recruit and now we've got these pig lungs that we've had in a freezer and have thawed a few times and refroze a few times, and they still get recruitment, right? You've seen it, we've done it lots of times, they get lots of recruitment, even after being thawed and refroze and thawed and refroze. Recruitment is? Recruitment, your alveoli recruitment. It's where you're getting your alveoli to open up and hit those capillary beds. And so you'll see it in the lungs and they'll get nice and pink and fluffy. And then when you take your BBM with the peep valve off, they'll stay nice and pink and fluffy as to whereas if you don't have a peep valve, they go flat immediately. And you don't get a nice peep fluff ever without a peep valve. Think about it like a, like a balloon. You blow up your balloon, right? And you have to have that like initial, and then it pops open. If you don't have a peep valve, that balloon goes all the way empty. But if you have peep, you will have, say your balloon's this big, and you deflate it to half that, the next breath is much easier, Why? right? Well, that's peep and it, uh, it's very beneficial to your patients. Um, I think the, the study they did with this um, uh, passive oxygenation is they, they paralyzed somebody and it was like over 20 minutes of not breathing and they were able to keep this patient's SpO2 above 93%. So, you know, if the doctor says, what's with the cannula and all this, let's just say it's, it's better. It really is. And take this but, time to get like to breathe and set up. So for PEEP, is there like a certain amount of PEEP that's like kind of standardized for adults versus kids? Or is there a certain amount that you would just start it out with? So intrinsically we breathe about a five. Okay, so a about five, five is five pretty, peep. Yeah. When we put somebody up on PEEP, like on the ventilator, it's mm -hmm. like six to eight, normally okay. eight, um, because we're, we've tubed them, they're on a ventilator, there's a reason why they're intubated, mm -hmm. so we're gonna give them a little extra help. Yeah. Um, peep, obviously it helps with oxygenation yeah. and so if we can give them a little more peep and a little less tidal volume yeah. for a sick lung then we'll reverse that um, so it's just some finesse with the ventilator mm -hmm. and the peep valve but you should when you put your patients on a peep valve on a BBM have you ever seen have you looked I've at seen it? it I've seen it and I've always I've had it to the respiratory yeah. because I wasn't sure okay how much peep should I be giving them when I set it up and so I would like to know when I set it up if I'm getting it yeah, in the right Just range, take a look so. at it because it's normally a yeah. twist valve yeah. and it's like 5, 10, 15, 20. Yeah. And um, 
it goes 5, 10, 15, yes. 20, not groups, yeah. right? Yeah. And so you just twist it down to 5, you want to add some more. If you're putting it on, I think I start at like, when I was learning it was mm -hmm. 10, but yeah. you could start it at 5. Yeah. If you're not getting good recruitment, go Especially up. for kids, yeah, it would so. probably be like a 5 is. Yeah, season. we normally yeah. start our peep at 6 for kids. Okay. Yeah, tightening it down is 20 because it starts by because all it right. is there's all a little the spring out. in there yeah and all it is is just adding resistance to your exhale right. breath and actually i had one pull it out of the package was breathing against it i was like i want to see what this feels like how well does this work <laughs> and with a peep of five you just have to exhale a little bit but a peep of 15 you actually kind of have to you know as a non-innovative patient you, know, mm -hmm. you have to kind of breathe against it a bit all, right. all it is is a little spring okay. and it's just right there and you know we set our peep valve to 15 because we know that we, we, we suck at putting like it's having so that good. seal, yeah. so we're, we intentionally so overshoot the feet mm -hmm. to yeah. make up for our lack of, you know, good seal okay. on, on the face. So did you say we are getting these, or we don't have them, or have we uh, just I think them? you guys had the the valve, but okay. they don't. They yeah. come on the bag. Med supply orders. They I, come on the bag and they get ordered yeah. separately. I think I've seen them on the bag. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think they were making it happen. And I don't know in mm -hmm. one form. Okay. Um. I can't, I not like, Clyde Let's has a soapbox about, um, our tea should be here at yeah. this bus, yeah. at uh, post-sedation uh, management, or post-intubation sedation, pre-oxygenation, um, the BVM, do you guys know how much a full squeeze on an adult BVM is? Like, the like title volume? What do you like, mean? Yeah, like the title the volume, a full squeeze on a BVM, like a what lot? you're delivering. Yeah. It's the right answer. A lot. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but you want to be given like 450, right? Like, you want to be given. If you, you get just a full squeeze, squeeze yes. Yes. on an adult BVM, you're yeah. giving 1,500 to two <laughs> liters of volume. That's a lot. That's, That's a lot. lot. That's too much. No. Do you guys know what you can deliver on a full squeeze on a pediatric BVM? Probably like too much. I don't know. <laughs> if you give it a hard, a forceful squeeze, you can get up to 1,000. Mm -hmm. But normally you're right around about 500 on a good, just normal you squeeze. Right around mm -hmm. to what they need now. Yeah, right just, around just enough to blow on you. Yeah. And so what happens in these code situations or when we're getting your nervous, you're going, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. so um, what do you guys know what a normal title volume is for a normal, like a male, female adult? Like 350, 450-ish. Four, four to six. Four I agree. Yeah. When I look at <laughs> for a short person, for a kilogram. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm measuring when I when I do my like uh, competencies for work, I always pick 400 because 400 falls in for a healthy lung for yeah. a five foot nothing female to a six foot adult. So I pick 400. 400. Is and so <laughs> you know, should if you had to reach for a BVM, what should we might reach for? Maybe a pediatric BVM, right? But what's on the code? But what's on the code? <laughs> <laughs> the big one. Just, just give it a squeeze, Stacy. Yeah, that's all. Kiddos, what's kiddos? Kiddos, yeah, they're. Well, it's the same. It's the same. Same per range. kilo. Yeah. 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 But it's so obviously less. It's less for sure. Mm -hmm. So. I don't know. What was it? Ours was not very much. Like kids vary in size. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's six I mean, to eight ml per kilo. Per kilo. Okay. You know, it could be anywhere from forty cc's. It's like. You know, which is. Such a small amount yeah. that you think. I mean, that's less yeah. than a two year old. I had a two year old that was like 80 constantly, yeah, eating, so, so I wasn't sure. Like, so, a two year old would yeah. be like 50, 60 yeah. to 80 cc, yeah, would be an appropriate title okay. for a two year old. So, kids, so not a lot, no. yeah. And LTVs don't go down that far, mm -hmm. you know, um, unless you put it in infant mode, which then you have some issues with the alarms and stuff like that. So, yeah, you know, when in doubt with the kid, just have somebody mm -hmm. manually ventilate, but keep track of the time. Like your your respiratory rate and just just an upper chest rise and fall. That's all you need. Pre-treatment. Um, prepare for potential hypotension. The medications you're giving are going to cause hypotension uh, nine times out of ten, and give at least a 250 to a 500 fluid challenge and then repeat PRN. If their blood pressures are soft to begin with, give fluid bolses, reassess, take the time to set them up. If you're going to push induction agents with a soft blood pressure, you're going to cause hypotension. If these people are in any type of period arrest state, you're gonna put them into arrest. Um, you've got to, got to, got to prep your patients. Um, resuscitate before you intubate. Um, anything else you wanna add on? This is also the stage where you pre-treatment, if you were gonna give any type of push dose presser or anything like that, would be in the stage. I don't know how often you guys are doing that here, if you're doing it at all. Yeah. We, don't, we don't do push dose pressers, like ever. Okay. At least not the doctors we normally work with never them we always if we think we'll just mix a bag of soup that or something okay 
That's better than nothing. Yeah. Just string it up and start it. <laughs> it's not gonna hurt. Yeah. Position. Uh, what do we do when we intubate? Towels under the shoulders. Towels under shoulders. Do we do it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but do you lay your bed flat? No, we okay. give it up a little bit. Cool. Because most of the time, we like, yeah, these your question? That people <laughs> no, 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 Throw the bed flat. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> set them up just like you would with a kid to get proper positioning to line all that up so you have a um, better success rate at your first pass induction. Um, make sure you've got good lights, put yourself in good position, and hopefully get a first pass success on them. I left these medications in there just as um, examples in the sequence. Um, so once your oxygenation's up high enough, uh, if you need cricoid pressure, uh, the proper way to do that is for you to put your hand there and then for whoever's intubating to manipulate your hand for the amount of pressure that you need. It's not something to where the nurse puts their hand on the, on the thyroid membrane and then she manipulates it how she thinks like, oh, maybe I should do this, yeah. maybe I should do this. It's something to where the person inducting should be manipulating the hand to get the right amount of pressure. Make sure they're pre-oxygenated and resuscitated prior to pushing your medications. You're gonna push your med, one person's gonna push drugs and watches the monitor and passes equipment. The other person in our situation would induce the tube and secure it for following placement uh, confirmation. The gold standard for placement confirmation? Color change and color change. Color change. Here, you guys have an answer. Yes. Yeah. Um, Atomidate uh, for sedation and sucks for a paralytic. And then, even though like it's a emergent situation, take your time to push your drug appropriately, especially especially with some of the ones we're going to talk about. Um, you won't be able to pass the tube if you push it too fast. Spontaneous breathing. Make sure that they're paralyzed before you go putting stuff in their mouth and soiling your airway. So, up until that, this is like, that's all you need, right? So, that's, that's how important it is. Um, so, when it comes to whoever's actually performing the um, actual laryngoscopy, um, encourage whoever's doing it to leave with suction, like we talked about, you know, the soiled airway, you lose your landmarks, um, and everybody gets uh, worked up. Um, uh, at our program, we use video laryngoscopy to um, assist with our first pass success. Because that way I can have, if, if we're both working, I can say, hey, you see the cords? Cool. And that way we can, we have double confirmation that we're in the right spot. Um, if your SpO2 drops below 92%, abort the mission and bag them up. This is something that doctors hate to do. They, they hate it. There's <laughs> this like, it's on a pedestal of, like, we got a tube, we got a tube the first time. Why? We're not, we're not <laughs> baseball players. We don't have stats. If you, if you miss, it's okay. I've missed tubes, and I'll miss them again. Um, encourage them to say, let's, let's do something different. If we miss, we, we do something different, because the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over, expecting this, a different result. If we change something, we position them differently, we get a smaller tube, whatever it is, we try a bougie versus a stylet, all those things, or you put in an LMA, that's okay, it still counts, we'll take an LMA, we can still ventilate with them, um, and we're not gonna you know, give anybody a hard time for not doing that. Um, I've seen people go four times plus on children, and the SPO2 went down to zero every single time, and I was coming unglued. It wasn't our patient yet, so we couldn't do anything about it, but imagine our frustration me and my partner sitting there watching them give, give this patient an anoxic brain injury for their own ego it has been proven too once you hit 92 percent the slope is immediate drop off yeah. so once they're once uh, the tooth's in the right spot go to your stomach first um, because if you start meddling the stomach you'll hear it and esophageal intubations are you know they're easy to do um, Listen to the uh, left side, because you know, we're just how the anatomy is based. Your right mean stem goes down much easier because of that curve, because mm -hmm. there's three lobes here and two lobes here. Um, and uh, get the um, colometric device entitled either way. Um, they both will uh, confirm it. Um, don't put the tube too deep. Um, that's another thing. Um, this seems to happen very often. Um, it'll be the right placement at the beginning, and then as your you know, patient's being bagged, they're being moved, every time you, that 
BBM comes off and back on, it can slide that down. So they'll say, oh, it's it's 22 at the blip, but now it's 26 and it's inadvertently been randomly extended. It, it happens, but get that securement device on there as quick as you can to uh, prevent that from happening and then have a radiologist snap an x-ray. You guys are good to go. Do you guys know what the tube depth should be? Like if you had to like just have something in your pocket to say, okay, I think that's about right. About 22, 24. Like three, three times the tube size typically. Oh, okay. Yeah. If it's a little high, it's okay. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. it's still gonna get air down yeah. both sides, but if it's too low, it's not yeah. okay. Yeah. Uh, just a quick note, kind of talk for pre-oxygenation. I cannot tell you how many times I've started to pre-oxygenate a patient to RSI and they come around enough that I don't have to yeah. RSI this patient. <laughs> Um, I've had peds, I've had 80 year old grandmas that they think are stroking out, and I start to pre oxygenate for RSI and With I your fancy peep, and I end up not, <laughs> being, not having to, to intubate the patient. Yeah. Well, I was just thinking how many times, like with LV COVID patients, that like sometimes 92, 90 is the best we can get. And oh, we, we like in the high 80s, we're like, like, let's go. We're yeah. like, yeah, this is the only option we have. And then I'm like, wow, I wonder if we have those peep valves that would help. Like, Pre-oxygenating more and just yeah. like bump it that. Really, it really, it really does. We, I've actually taken patients out of here during the height of COVID. They, we got them at seventy-seven. Yeah. And they're looking like us. They're, they're called a happy hypoxic. Yeah. It's like, yeah. let's ride. I had a dude we don't need to do anything. walk in from the parking lot. He's like, I feel kind of dizzy. I don't well, feel well. His O2 was forty-nine <laughs> percent. And he walked in from yes. the car. Yes. Yes. He wasn't even that like. He he looked all right. I'm like, all right, yeah. man, cool. You're dizzy, and then I'm like, oh, you're yeah. dizzy. Okay, I got you. Yeah. Sometimes all they need is a little peep, and I am a firm believer in poor man's BiPAP. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a peep valve, if you don't have a BiPAP ready, if you don't have a BBM with a peep valve, um, throw on a high flow nasal cannula with your non rebreather and get some them some extra peep going. Um, I've tried on supported this last year, uh, time and time again, taking people off a of BiPAP that they can't tolerate very well, or we can't transport that high flow of oxygen that far, and they do phenomenal on a high flow nasal cannula and a yeah. non rebreather. How long were we at the bedside at like an SB, trying to get this patient stabilized and because they were on BiPAP and we just could not work it out, and we, didn't have, we don't have enough oxygen to carry these yeah. patients all the way, so we got her where we needed to be. Yeah. Like, all right, we just need to lower our threshold on what we're accept, yeah. like willing to accept as far as a pulse ox. Yeah. <laughs> Pulse intubation management, sedation, and pain management. Um, we'll get into that a little bit on your cheat sheet. Uh, you should be giving, if your sedation medication is not a dual, you should be giving some type of pain management with the sedation. Um, control the patient's pain and sedation, look at the patient. And the monitor, increased heart rate equals pain, tearing, biting the tube is inadequate sedation. All right, we're gonna go over some meds. Did you, did you say you've been in the box before? I have been in the box. I've, I've done it twice. That's, that's all I've got. Yeah, I've been in the box. Do you want to get in the box? The heart block. <laughs> I, 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 I know Atomidate. That's the one I'm most familiar with is Atomidate. Are we allowed to open this and up? I was gonna open pro. it. Yeah, and yeah. we had a show box. Okay, yeah. get in there. I mean, I wouldn't crack any of the bottles, but yeah. Yeah, <laughs> pop, and, pop the gas off. Pop the bottles. I'm <laughs> So, so not, not the UK with that cheat sheet, the little coordinated one. Yeah, I think it's cool. With help from nurses and doctors in the ER. Yeah. Like, they've only had me get, these are the only ones that come in. Yeah, sucks as it, okay, it's rock. Yeah, yeah. So, no, nobody gets. All right, so. Also, those lovely Jim made us these like really fantastic cards. I, I brought and this. All of those, yeah. It yeah. makes me really sad because yep. this bag would have had weight dose yeah. measurements. On. I know. Oh, the old pharmacist you were talking about. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, those cards, though, we need to like make a lot more of those, and they need to be readily available. And, and they, the yeah, on. Stephanie was talking to me about ways to change them yeah. a little yeah. bit, and so yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm that's okay. yeah. why so what's it's here about, to work like, on. What do you want to talk about? The most? <laughs> We'll talk about them all, yeah. but we can get into depth. I do want to just talk about them all, honestly, because okay. I'm still unfamiliar with them. I mean, I can Perfect. Push it. Can just go, like, go down the line. Can we talk about the benefits down. of like rock versus versus yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. 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 All right. So uh, rocks on top. Good this here is on top. Rocks on top because it's the best. Yes. Yeah. Why? Why do we? I why like do we love rocks so much? 
Because it sounds cool to say. Right. Because <laughs> I mean, I have almost always, except for like a few doctors, it's always like accommodating sucks. And those are like always sucks. like my. It's old school, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. those are like the ones that always stay in their mind. So, our, let's start with accommodate and sucks because. Start with the induction agent. We'll, mm-hmm. we'll start with accommodate and sucks because this is what we see a lot. We mm-hmm. see it a lot across the county. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, this is what people like to use, and we'll tell you why. So, sucks. What are some things we want to look out for for sucks? Do we want to use sucks in burn patients? Uh, by the sound of it, no. no. Mm-hmm. But I don't know why. So sucks is a depolarizing neuromuscular okay. blocker. Um, without getting into the AMP too much, you've got these chains, like your all your 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 neural chains. What it does is it um, the way it activates to stop muscles from working is it. Um, binds to the acetylcholine um, inhibitors, and what it does is it constantly de- uh, depolarizes, mm-hmm. and what it does is with that depolarization, it will cause the fasciculations that you guys always see, oh, the little okay. like twitching and all that stuff, but what that does is it causes your cells to offload a bunch of potassium. Oh, so okay. it's yeah. So potassium, right. like it's, you know, too much potassium is bad, obviously, mm-hmm. right, because it can cause yeah. hyperkalemia. Um, and with your um, with your burn patients, people that burn, they're, all their cells are yeah. dying. So yeah. what's yeah. that doing? Lots of potassium. Lots of mm-hmm. open, right? Yeah. Potassium. Yeah. I always think of it as a banana. Like potassium yeah. in a banana, so potassium's inside the cell. Mm-hmm. So when those bananas bust open, you've got all these things that happen. And there's one more massive contraindication with sex and choline, and it's just based on patient history. It's malignant hyperthermia. Oh. So that's a that's a huge. It's more common in males. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, and if they have any family history. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Clyde always says we've got to be perfect with imperfect information. That is one of these scenarios. Mm-hmm. You probably will never know that your patient has a history of that. Mm-hmm. Okay. But given all those things. Or a family history. And it's not like we, I don't even think, do we even keep dantrolene here? No. No. Yeah. So with all those contraindications relative or absolute, what's another paralytic we could give that doesn't have as many contraindications? Rock. So let's talk about why having they like this one. <laughs> yeah. Do you guys, do you guys know the duration of sucks? It's probably a longer duration and it's rock. Or is it no, a shorter duration? It's shorter. It's shorter. Eight minutes at max. Yeah. Eight minutes. That's yeah. why doctors like it because if they mess up then or something goes wrong, yeah. it's going to wear off and the patient will hopefully start breathing again on their yeah. own. Yeah. Eight mm-hmm. minutes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if you do your airway assessment and you find that it's going to be a difficult airway, mm-hmm. Probably not your best candidate. You might need an extra, some extra time for them to be paralyzed. Okay. Rock. Uh, dosing for rock. I remember one that had been our, our protocol for a long time. It's on 1.5. Mm-hmm. Um, why do you like rock? Do you guys know the duration of rock? It's probably longer. <laughs> so longer time to. Longer time. Yeah. It's also, so sucks was a polarizing. Mm-hmm. Rock is. Must be non-polar. Non. Mm-hmm. So all those issues could not be an issue anymore. Mm-hmm. The duration of this is 20 to 30 minutes. It gives you a little bit of time, but it's not quite as long as VEC. <clears throat> VEC, you're looking about 45-ish. Mm-hmm. It'll last a while. Minutes. Mm-hmm. 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 With kids, it lasts yeah. even longer for some reason. I don't know. And you so. have to reconstitute that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's one more step when you're already stressed yeah. out. Um, dosing for VEC, 0. 0.1. On the cheat sheet, I think it was, yeah, that's that's what we give, so. And we'll go over it. We'll go over it on the cheat sheet. So there's your differences between the three paralytics that you guys carry. What's rock dosing again per kilogram? Rock is 1.5. 1. 1. 1. 1.5 per kilogram. Um, yeah, we have 1 to 1.5 on If any of your Just patients are hemodynamically yeah. unstable, you should be cutting your doses down on, um, your sedation agents mm-hmm. and things like that. Or little old people that are naive on medications. Yeah. So there's your differences. Oh, uh, big, dif- big differences in these yeah. are your duration. One more thing with sucks. Um, with potassium, the patients with renal failure, the potassium is probably already high. Oh, yeah. So that's just one more thing you have yeah. to okay. exacerbate. So. Okay. A lot of things with potassium. Yeah. 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 Atomidate. What do we know about atomidate? 
The only thing I've been taught about it so far is that it messes with the cortisol levels and stuff, so you need adrenal suppression. Yeah. Yeah, so you need a lot of fluids. You need a lot of fluids. Yeah. So what patients do we want to use caution? Adrenal suppression. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just Ca uh, use cautiously in uh, autonomy. CHFers, mm -hmm. sepsis patients, mm -hmm. yes. sepsis patients. I watched this be pushed Jim on. Jim literally wrote the comments, not in sepsis, and adrenal suppression. I, I, worked, I did an RSI with Jim on a patient. I can still see it in my head. In bed one, they pushed Atomidate on a septic patient, and we were behind the eight ball immediately. Mm. If you're going to use Atomidate, if you're going to use Versed as a follow-up, you better have used your preparation area appropriately. Okay? If your patient is septic, use caution and automidate. If they're hypotensive, use caution with automidate. It's going to cause hypotension. Okay? Um, 0 0.3 milligrams per cake on this one, and the duration is six minutes. Another reason why they like this one, because why? It wears off fast if something happens. Uh, we'll talk about Medaz. I'm surprised this is in here. But it well, is. Well, it's locked. Locked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Midazolam. You can use this for induction, but it should be paired with blood. Fentanyl. Fentanyl. If you're pairing this with fentanyl for induction, what should you be hanging post-sedation management? Fentanyl and Versetrin. Fentanyl and a Versetrin. Mm -hmm. It does not have dual action therapy. Uh, the dosing, I don't know yours. I'll have to look up on the chart. What's the cheat sheet? Let me tell you. 0.05. Okay. 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 That's, that's why we're going to make them for our bad. Like, but they was like, that's <laughs> why <laughs> we went over it with uh, okay. Stephanie yeah. to try to make yeah. it. What's the side effect of Medazolam? Hypertension. Again. Yeah. 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 You got two. Who want that? Again. Preparation with your fluids. Keep them hanging. You've got Romazicon in here. That's awesome. Woo! That's Actually, what's the reversal for? Benzo. Benzo. Mm -hmm. Why do we want to be careful in Romazicon reversal? Withdrawal. With your withdrawals, oh, which will yeah. cause, can cause seizure mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Then we got the Benzo in there. It's fine. You want to Yeah. Let's see. Let's Check them. Was ketamine on the cheat sheet? Ketamine is on the cheat sheet. So, yeah. But they don't want but it's us to do case. ketamine drop. Or drips mm -hmm. here. Okay. It's in the Pixis, it's not in here. Okay. I don't know why. Maybe that'll change it. Do Marcus. That's the only time um, I've used the convenience. Or place. when Tina comes in her helicopter and like, let me mix this drip for you. Can <laughs> yeah, we, like, we yeah, yeah, I think the, the, the drugs I give the most is Zofran and ketamine. ketamine. Grams and grams and grams of ketamine. Yeah. I mean, it great. is one stop shopping. Mm -hmm. yeah. Our yeah. protocol <laughs> is ketamine and Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, ketamine is a jewel. So if you hang ketamine, you're done. That does not mean you're done completely because if your patient is not sedated on a ketamine dose, you need to be adding fentanyl. Okay. Fentanyl and ketamine work well together. Mm -hmm. Propofol and fentanyl work well together. Um, fentanyl Propofol. just pairs well yeah. with all the other sedation mm -hmm. medications. It's like a fine wine. So here's your cheat sheet. <laughs> Propofol? No, ketamine. Oh. This does mm -hmm. what? Causes hypotension. Yeah. It causes hypotension. Not so bad. And not so bad. Um, Nine times out of ten won't have a lot, huge effect. If you're pushing ketamine for induction and you've got a hemodynamically unstable patient, cut it in half with any of your sedation medications. Um, help them out. Do you want to talk about the speed of which you yes. push those next to? Yes. Um, so <laughs> ketamine is a big one. If you slam ketamine, do you guys know what will happen? Answer. Push slow to avoid apnea. Push slow to avoid <laughs> apnea. Yeah. The biggest issue is you'll have laryngeal geospasms. Your vocal cords will shut, and it will be like you with your kids. You're blowing on like candy wrappers, and back. you know, whistles. Yeah. You will not get a tube in until that ketamine wears off. Uh, we picked up. Well, we tried to pick up a patient. Um, it was a I don't know the situation, um, but ketamine was used, and they gave us a situation where they were unfamiliar with the speed. Um, they snapped the vocal cord shut and they ended up having a crisis patient because they coded because of the failed airway and then ended up um, withholding termination at, after like 11 rounds of it. Wow. So. Is there any of these sedation meds that cannot be paired together? So when they need more and they want more or can they all so be given together? So typically like when I watch a, mm -hmm. an RSI at bedside, typically they'll push a tonic and then Three minutes later, they'll push it to more automate. Yeah. Three minutes later, they'll push it to more automate. Because is not a long-term sedation medication. Yeah. 
um, you should push atomidate, get successful intubation, then became some type of other drug. Okay. Propofol um, can be paired, um, should be paired with fentanyl. Because I've had them do atomidate and prop is what I've had them do. Yeah. As okay. pushes yeah. or hung? No, no. As a hung prop yes. after so atomidate. So push and then a hang? Uh, yeah. 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 So not, that's normal. Not uncommon. Okay. Okay. Uh, especially ICU patients will be on propofol over something yeah. else. Yeah. Um, like I haven't hang, had them hang fentanyl yet. I've only had them hang prop afterwards. Yeah. But yeah. It's not very common as a infusion. Is it infusion? Yeah. No, no I don't I don't they never infuse only push, okay. but the prop was our hung med afterwards. Sure. Yeah. And this is uh, rock, sucks, and Beck. And that says to use if you need to redose a paralytic, there are a very few select amount of times that you should be re paralyzing. It's normally a sedation issue instead mm -hmm. of a paralytic issue. Um, if you've got, like, a, you just can't get them synchronized, you get some asynchrony on your ventilator, mm -hmm. and you've sedated and you've done all these uh, troubleshooting, then, like, you go through this long list of troubleshooting options before you re paralyze your patient. Yeah. Um, another thing that might be appropriate is if you've got um, a spinal cord, some type of neurogenic, and you just can't keep them down, like, keep their in involuntary movements down because of the injury, mm -hmm. a paralytic might not be a bad option. But, like I said, there's very few reasons why you should be re paralyzing your patient. Um, ketamine. Uh, I forgot where I was going with that. As far as what? Did you just talk about the speed? Um, yeah, speed for push. It should be like one to two minutes yeah. at the fastest, mm -hmm. one minute at the fastest. Um, if you've got a septic patient, um, these might not be your best option. If you're gonna sedate with these, you might just hang your levofedrip mm -hmm. and get really high. And I know what, you guys go to 16 here? Mm -hmm. Oh. Mm -hmm. For yeah, yeah. 16? I, th I think I picked 20. up at your max at like, it might be 16 or 20. I think okay. it's 20. For sepsis patients, we go to 70. 70. Yeah. So. Oh, are um, you talking about propofol or levofed? Levofed. The levofed. Yeah. Because if you're using these for inductions, yeah. Be, or even sedation, be careful yeah. with that, with Versed. Yeah, on your septic patients, you might as well just hang a norepi drip um, right off the rip because right. they're, you're going to be fighting it constantly. Yeah. You won't have your patient sedated, you won't have them on any pressure, you won't have anything under control. So, Potomidate and Prope, you need to be having some Levofed and fluids going. Well, you should not, about we don't want Potomidate on a no, but, but it, it will happen. happen. It does <laughs> happen. happen to do it. And that's what you, you will be constantly fighting yeah. this. If you're fighting somebody on sedation and blood pressure, mm -hmm. and you're using a sedation medication that causes hypotension, mm -hmm. you should reevaluate mm -hmm. what your patient's on. Yeah. I've had patients that we've innovated that we haven't given anything because they've been so badly injured and they were, their blood pressures were so low that we just we left it dry. Like, I'm sorry, we can't give you anything to keep you comfortable. You yeah. just got thrown out of the car, and we'd rather you not die yeah. from exercisations. <laughs> but those catecholamines yeah. flow around, you know, keep them, keep them going. <clears throat> this right here, based on ideal body weight, that's what I wanted to talk about. Atomidate is an actual body weight because it's metabolized in the adipose tissue. Um, so this one is going to be actual body weight instead of ideal body weight. Um, other than that, everything else we typically base off of ideal body weight. I need to move that one down. <laughs> yeah, and these, actually the only one we base on actual is Atomidate. Not base, the okay. sex in it? on actual body weight too. I feel like we always try to do actual body weight on all of them. Mm -hmm. I feel like actually, actual it's more common. Happens. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it really well, is. it does make it easier for us to like right. calculate everything. Any questions on this slide? <laughs> so on here, you, for quick sedation and agitation treatment, if you, since this is this is your main sedation mm -hmm. that you use here, I'm gonna venture yeah. to say, yeah. yeah, you should always be hanging a fentanyl drip. Okay. And I can tell you, nine times out of ten, they're not. Why do I feel like Jim was like not down? Because Jim doesn't drip didn't like drips. fentanyl drips leaving the facility because, because it's the, like an the the So we always just did pushes. Well, so you always, yeah, and like we'll every. If, if we come in, we'll mix our own. We'll mix yeah, our yeah, own. yeah, exactly. So yeah, because. That, you know, um, we need sedation and pain meds. Yeah. It's a, yeah. it's a, it's a, it's a dual prong approach. Mm -hmm. You know, we always call it like a pro fentanyl drip. Um, cause if we, we, you know, all the time if we show up and there's one drug hanging and yeah. it's that white bottle, we're, we're already getting in the bag and, yeah. and mixing up our drip because yeah. we're going to, um, we're going to take that as well. Yeah. So, um, 
and we're not supposed to take uh, many NARCs from the facility anymore, minus this one because we don't carry pro again. So like you said earlier, you say, oh, I'm gonna mix a bag for the flight crew. Not anymore. Just oh. get some pushes and um, we'll make some weight for you. Okay. Why is that? Uh, it's a Do you DEA. just wanna waste all the NARCs? Yeah, because yeah. we, we can't, Confirm yeah, that, you you're, know that you've given us how much, yeah. and we, they can't confirm it. And it is a they can say that about every single And it's a controlled substance. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I mean, they just started really cracking down on us. I get it. Like, yeah. probably recently, should, and before that, I was like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> and now they've really cracked down, so now I'm mixing my own. Yeah. Um, morphine, use caution. It is a cause that is hypotension in your blood. If you're confident in your blood pressure and things are groovy, feel free to push it. Um, it's not something that we go to as white crew for sedation. Um, we will use push dose fentanyl. Uh, we love fentanyl. Um, That's it, so it doesn't cause low blood pressure like fentanyl morphine does? Fentanyl does not have the same effects on your hemodynamics as morphine does. Okay. It's a little more. That's kind of cool. Um, I didn't know that. That's yeah. a, a kind of the reason why we switched to Fona instead of Mona. Mm -hmm. That's a discussion mm -hmm. in and of itself. But yeah. um, fentanyl does not have the effects that morphine does in those situations. So we're giving a lot more pain management in like interiors and things like that, that people are afraid to give pain management in um, because it doesn't cause those effects and that near as bad. And just with a little bit of fluid resuscitation, you're set up, set up for a good transport and the patient's not hurting near as bad. So morphine is not one we typically use a lot. Um, it does cause the hypotension and in your elderly population, you're cutting that in half. If you're not cutting it in half, I'm sure they're getting a nice we do use uh, we carry Ativan we don't use it for this near as much and I don't think we use it near as much as we should uh, Versed is normally just the first thing in mind for everything that we use need a benzo for the good thing about Ativan is it's kind of like fentanyl is it doesn't have that huge drop that Versed does um, so Ativan is would be fine I suppose but it's just not something that we use for this situation. Mm -hmm. And even for seizures, um, sometimes it's an afterthought, I'll push for said, for said, for said, and sometimes it's not working well and they're hypotensive and I'm like, oh, I should try some out of band just for those aspects. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that. Always put in these things, uh, insert a Foley, we appreciate it. NG tube, that helps us ventilate if you're, uh, we'll talk about a little bit more in vent management. Do you guys prefer NG or OG? Doesn't matter. Okay. Something to, something to do. Something to do. <laughs> yeah. 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 And if it's not there, it's okay, we'll do it all yeah. the way. But, oh, yeah. Yeah. No, we had a kiddo that was a detox. He was, what is that? Kiddo? Yeah, he was, oh, kiddo, it was not kiddo, sorry. Gypsum weave. Gypsum weave, oh, that one. Oh my gosh. That one was horrendous. We couldn't get the freaking NG tube down. We couldn't get anything down. He was just pissed. We did two, <laughs> they did two courses of uh, rock for him, which I wasn't sure if wow. that was just, yeah, they, they gave him two of rock and we were just pushing meds and he kept just like waking up and doing this crap and he was That's I've only seen so gypsum don't do drugs. I've only seen don't do drugs. Gypsum weed overdoses out of the imbalance. No, that one boys was, ranch. That really? one was yeah. it was the boys ranch. It yeah. was that I'm there. Okay, yeah. so like because it's, it's all over the place. It's all over the place. They go out <laughs> and they're trouble <laughs> teens and like, it's the white chunk of the little flowers. flower. Yeah. I'll bring some in yeah. for you. It's on the road in Saint David. Yeah, don't they like steep it like tea and then drink it? There's like a spiky seeds. ball with yeah, the seeds. seeds in it. Oh. Yeah, that's what they, yeah, that's what they seeds, do. Yeah. And depending on how much they get is how bad off no, they are. That one so what is it for actually this. like chemically? What is oh. it? Is it like an opiate or Ooh. like no. hallucinogen? Yeah, and, yeah. Oh. It's like so oh. then they get really like, LSD sometimes LSD. they'll get like dazed and just stare out. Sometimes they get really rigid. Like No, he was insane. Yeah. Like, yeah. Depending on how much they taste. Sounds like a good time. Are you guys busy this weekend? Sure, this out. We can have some busy. Do you guys have any questions? No. Any comments, no. concerns? Yeah. Helpful. Should, I feel like we should definitely do this like yearly instead of like the really quick. Um, you know the thing we do every October that's really great kind of updates. Great updates. Great updates. Like we have like great updates and it's super quick and like we like pass by it and don't really pay attention. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is much more productive. Good. Cool. Ten out of ten. Veronica, you can join us for the uh, questions for yeah. And you are in the room and RT has left. Uh, it's really good to know that you what you need to do to troubleshoot it. Um, some things that coincide is sometimes you'll have alarms and you'll have low blood pressure or this, that, or the other. If you could look at your vent and say, okay, I've got way too much peep or my tidal volume is too high because if you've got too much peep, if you've got too much pressure going on in the lungs, that could be causing issues with your blood pressure. Um, so it's really like, I know when I was here, 
And then I went to fly. They're like, what do you know about the vent? I'm like, I'm not supposed to touch it. Yeah, it's off limits. <laughs> it's off limits. Don't touch. That didn't last long, did it? Yeah. yeah. No, not at all. So I started from square one learning the vent when I came to flight. Um, so the purpose of this is just to kind of teach you guys to have some tools in your pocket, some things when the vent's alarming that you can say, okay, is it a low pressure? Is it a high pressure? If it's low pressure, what am I going to check? vice versa for the high pressure and things that can do to me. Nine times out of 10, if your vent's alarming and it's a high pressure, you should check your sedation. Make sure that your patient's out because if you're having high pressure alarms, nine times out of 10, it's your sedation. They're coughing. Yeah. Or they're chewing, or chewing on yeah. it. They're yeah. hanging. They hurt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is our transport ventilator. It's, it's very similar to this. The so fronts are very similar. High pressure is usually, you know, something closing up the vent, right? And so the other one would be suction. Is that the only yes. kind of suction? Yes, yeah. yeah. So sometimes they may have a yeah. this plug or, yeah. you know, uh, maybe they, you know, like on the verge of, you mm -hmm. know, like pulmonary edema and they've got some... So not enough sedation and suction. Yeah, and you guys use ballards for inline suction? We, I, I don't know. know the I haven't seen them. Okay. No, because I know we have, I'm used to using it's, inline, but I haven't seen them. The, it's not in that tube. It's not in that tube. Oh, yeah, I will pull that mustache. Just go over there. I will get an inline suction. Yeah, I was just going to ask. Thank you. What do you use for suctioning that tube? Yeah, it's like, I find like, I just put my mouth to the tube. Make sure my mustache isn't in the way. I used to ballard. We don't have ballard. We don't have ballard. Yeah, I don't think we That's okay. They do use it regular. Yeah. That's that's Which good enough. I have to think about that for a second because, like, with my in home kiddos, they have ballards and you just, you know, suction them and it's no big deal. You go yeah. about your way. It's yeah. nice yeah. because it's, you know, it's cleaner. It's, it it's all, yeah. but, it's you know, and mm -hmm. you don't have to pop the circuit off. So if yeah. you have some patient that's really peep dependent, it's all mm -hmm. about the peep. Yeah. Um, yeah. You don't have to disconnect that. But if you need to suction them and you got to pull this off, it's okay. Because, yes. I mean, you know, you might have to take some time to build that peak back up, okay. but at least their airway is, you know, not going to alarm on that So the ventilator can actually, so this is our, our ventilator case. It's going to be a little different. We cannot call it a commercial BiPAP or CPAP. We call it MPPV or MPPV with pressure support for us. But you guys can do intubation, CPAP, and BiPAP on said machine. Do you guys know the difference between CPAP and BiPAP? So the biggest difference between them, pressure, right. and then by 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 level, right? By level. See, Tina doesn't yeah. even know. What I'm <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah, by level, positive airway pressure. Airway so pressure. You've got you've got two pressures. CPAP is peep. Yeah. And PPV is peep with a little bump. So when they breathe in, they have a little bit more pressure to. Get some ventilation is, yeah. a, is how I look at it. It gives it a little extra smack to help you not have to breathe so hard. So you can do all that on that machine. Sweet. Dinner. Controls. <laughs> I put this picture up here because it's kind of it's good to see why we use ideal body weight versus actual body weight. Um, because yeah. as you can see, your insides don't change. Yeah. So um, that's why we do everything off of ideal body weight when we're setting up the vent. Um, your tidal volume should be based off of ideal body weight. Um, it's six to eight uh, for a healthy lung. If you've got sick lungs, you should be giving a smaller tidal volume. Um, uh, six is the middle. Four, we go four to six for unhealthy, six to eight for healthy. So six is kind of your middle. Um, the only, I don't normally, I can, think I can speak for Clyde too. I don't normally go up to the eight unless we're having some type of oxygenation problems. Yeah, if it's, if it's a healthy lung and they got innovated for airway protection, instead of AIDS, yeah. but we were talking earlier about um, high tidal volumes, and this is the main culprit, is you get someone who's 300 pounds, they say, oh, this is their tidal volume for that yeah. person. It's now, weight, yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be a little too much. Now, you know, most people, <laughs> you've got this you know, functional reserve capacity and your lungs can take a lot of volume, mm -hmm. but over time, that's unhealthy, especially when you get up in the air, yeah. and all those things can just can keep stacking up, and you know you can cause barotrauma trauma and pop lungs and things like that. So, if we keep it in a nice set range for the ideal body weight, then we don't have those problems. So, on the vent, you can set all these things. You have control over your breath rate, which you have all this. You have all this control over your BVM as well. Mm -hmm. So, if you're BVMing, you can essentially do what you can do on a ventilator. So how fast 
as you can squeeze your bag, you can set your breath rate on the ventilator. It's inspiration time, how quickly you squeeze that bag. Mm -hmm. Tidal volume is how much you put in when you squeeze it, and we talked about why we do it on ideal body weight. Pressure control, can't really do. Pressure support, peep is that valve, and sensitivity has to do with the circuit, and we probably won't dig too far deep into that um, uh, option on the ventilator. Yeah, it's more for moving around. So you got your breath mode, your breath type O2 sensitivity, which we already talked about. Your breath mode is ACE and SIMB, which are options. Like if your patient is healthy, breathing on, you know, they're taking some breaths, maybe SIMB is more appropriate for them. Maybe they can't handle. So in assist control, the ventilator is just giving them constantly whatever you have set to that monitor. And even if they take a breath on their own, they're gonna get that set tidal volume over that eye time. If you put them in SIMB, they can take what they want. Leave what they don't, take what they want. It's a little easier for them to breathe, take their own breath. They're not getting smacked with a set amount of rate. Um, sometimes you'll have alarms on your vent because they're breathing against it. Um, you can do volume and pressure, and that's just how the amount of air gets delivered into the lung. Um, sometimes people do better with pressure delivery over volume. If you have somebody that had cardiac arrested and it was a crash airway, your typical AC volume is probably just fine for them because they're not really having any intrinsic breathing on their own. They were recently dead. FiO2 is what we call it on the vent instead of O2. Um, and you should titrate that appropriately. So these are the two different alarms you'll typically see is your low peak pressure and your high peak pressure. And we'll dig into that. Clyde's gonna set that up so you guys can play. Like I said, we were never allowed to touch the vent. We're gonna touch the vent today. We're gonna play with it, get used to it. Um, because if you do some type of intervention, you should be able to clear that alarm and see if that intervention worked. <laughs> so, low peak pressure, what are some causes we talked about, some of the high peak Disconnect. Disconnect. If you're having low peak pressures, start tr like troubleshooting. troubleshooting your tube. Um, make sure you're connected to the vent still. Make sure you're connected to the patient. Make sure that your oxygen tubing is still hooked up, yep. that you're not on now doing a low pressure system instead of a high pressure system. Um, Cuff. Make sure your cuff. cuff. Make sure you don't have a cuff. cuff. Um, sometimes we come in and get these patients, and you're hearing, you're like, is that a cuff leak? You check your uh, pressure in your your cuff, and it's fine. Uh, sometimes they're just goofy. Sometimes they might need just a little more air in that cuff. Um, but have you guys ever heard a leak, a cuff leak? It kind of sounds like they need suction. Yeah. If you ever want to do this, just kind of hear it in your doctor's school, deflate that cuff a little bit in your doctor's school. De deflate that cuff a little bit and you will hear exactly what a yeah. cuff, or like a cuff leak will sound like. It just sounds like junky lungs. Okay. So then when we hear that, we start to troubleshoot our cuff, right? So we're like, okay, what's our pressure in there? Oh, our pressure's either fine or, oh, hey, the balloon's not inflated anymore. Um, if you squeeze that little bubble where you inflate your cuff, you guys know what that does yeah. to the it's just squishy. Adios. Yeah. If you start squeezing on that bubble, um, you can squeeze on it and see how how much your cuff yeah. pressure is. Um, just to say, oh, it might be too much or too little. Yeah. But just be careful when you're sitting there. It should be like pushing on. Yeah. yeah. If you don't have a manometer, the easiest way yeah. to do it is just keep filling that thing up until you stop hearing the noise. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. all you need. That's all you need. <laughs> So they're not changing elevation, oh. you know, unless you have a loop yeah. where you hear that again. Um, I've had a situation where the cuff is too high, and then you have your high pressures going off, and it's just, yeah. So, so if yeah. the cuff is too high, that, yeah. that shouldn't change anything here, but what okay. that'll do is that'll cause, like, tracheal necrosis. Okay. Think of it as, like, a bent yeah. sore in your throat. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So we talked about, in, a, in an NRP, in another class I taught, when we talked about why we use cuff versus uncuffs in kids, mm -hmm. I asked Val, I'm sure you guys all know Val by now, and she goes, the only thing I can think of is that their rings are not fully formed, and so when you inflate that balloon and you overinflate that balloon, you run the chance of causing the 
trachea necrosis. So that's the only thing that kind of a so that's gee whiz nice right. to know about cuff versus uncuffed. Uh, so we talked about interventions. It's pretty easy for low pressure minus the, the cuff. You might have to do a, a tube exchange if the cuff is ruptured. Um, other interventions are easy. Pick your tube back up, right? High peak pressures uh, for alarms. You have nice alarms? Yeah. So we talked about it. Nine times out of ten is your patient's awake. So. Yeah. Fighting the vent. See if I get the high peak pressure. All the, all the alarms will make that noise, um, but then it'll actually say... Yeah, it'll scroll um, across the screen. What, what is this vent called? This is an LTV okay. um, 1200. And you guys have a couple different ones in there, mm -hmm. but uh, looks like this one's helpful. Oh, okay, so that's okay. You got your... There you we go. High pressure. Yeah. So it'll say on there, mm -hmm. high pressure. So it'll... It'll be loud, you know. Now it says don't silence, but you want to listen to that for 10 minutes before well, it parts it gets there. Because it'll yeah. still say high pressure. It will, yeah. Um, you actually have to hit the silence button a couple times for that alarm to clear off of the roll screen. Yeah. Um, so if you hit it once, it's not going to clear like what's wrong. Obviously, you've already looked at it and said, hey, hey I've got a high alarm. Mm -hmm. um, so we talked about the patient could be coughing, could be mm -hmm. chewing on the tube, you could have a mucus plug. Clyde talked about. Uh, negative and positive pressure changes in the lung. So what does that increase your risk of if you've got like a trauma? Pneumo. So some things to think about. If you've troubleshot the whole thing and you're still having these issues, you know, you might have given a, your patient a worsening pneumo and you need to do an intervention for that. Um, so sedation, sedation, sedation. If your patient's waking up, uh, you can give a push dose and increase your drip rate. Um, not uncommon to do. Sometimes, depending on how awake they are, if they're just tearing a little bit or their heart rate's elevated or things like that, you can just change your dosaging on your drips and they will accommodate to that. Sometimes they're on ketamine and they're maxed out on their ketamine dose and you need to hang a fentanyl drip or give some fentanyl pushes. Um, but don't be afraid to sedate your patients heavily for these things. And it's not uncomfortable. It's not comfortable to have a tube in your throat, so be sure you're doing the pain management aspects as well. Um, I like to transport patients with a GCS at this table. Like, we don't do sedation vacations. I want them snowed and not moving. It makes our lives a lot easier. Um, we talked a little bit about high tidal volumes and high peeps. If you have done everything you can and you're still fighting a low blood pressure, go reassess what your tidal volumes. Are. You don't have to touch this thing. Just walk up and say, okay, my peak may be 15, mm -hmm. and my tidal volume may be 600, go back to your desk and be like, okay, this is my range for tidal volume. I know that's a high peak. Um, maybe we actually talk to the physician about vent settings, or hey, I'm, fighting, I'm continually fighting this patient's blood pressure. I've given them bolus after bolus. I'm now at three liters. I've got them on the max of levofed, and um, I'm still fighting blood pressures. It might be your vent <coughs> Um, and the thing is rate. Right. Your rate is high too. It'll cause those hypotensions. Or it's too, well, I, what I see often at the hospital is too low. And these patients are formerly taken and, and need to that's, be for whatever reason. That's your rate's too low or the yeah, tidal volume? We said it too low, but it was originally 32 because they're yeah. DKA or whatever. That's a great and So point. we think, yeah. well, normal should be 12, 14. It's 12, but they're still yeah. trying to compensate. Yeah. So we can expand on that DKA a little bit, and with regards to post in, or pre intubation in time. So that may not be very common, but yeah. So if uh, you've got a DKA patient or someone who's like a you know you, you draw their blood gas and they're like a severe metabolic acidotic patient or something like that, where you know the easiest way to blow up that um, excess is is the respiratory rate, right? That's 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 the quickest one. Kidneys and, that's and all that. What, stuff, that's what right? they're doing when they're. Yeah. 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 So you take a DKA patient and you intubate them and say their in their pre their pre intubation entitle was like ten, for example. Yeah. You're like, oh my god, they're in cardiac arrest. No, because they're blowing, they're breathing yeah. so fast, they're trying to survive. Yeah. So you put them on this and they say, Alright, let's do the CAM vent settings. Rate of twelve, FIFA five hundred, AC, volume, hundred percent FOT. 
you're going to kill your patients yeah. because for that swing and intile, your pH goes down. Mm -hmm. It's this inverse portion. So your patient will be fine for 10, 15 minutes, and all of a sudden they, they code up mm -hmm. because you killed them. Because now their pH is in the trash. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, that's a good point um, because you know you got to wonder like why are they breathing so fast? You know. Because their body needs. Yeah, but you know, like before they like you, you walk in the room, EMS just dropped them off, and you're like, I have no idea. So you walk in, you go, okay. They've got these crazy deep respirations. I haven't done one diagnostic test yet. Maybe they're maybe they're nervous, or maybe they're very very sick. And uh, that's one of the things uh, that's very easy to do um, uh, to mismanage a patient after you take their airway is um, start swinging the pH in the wrong way. And if we if we hear we're taking a DKA patient and then we see a rate of sixteen. We pray that they have these huge tidal volumes because that's the only thing on the vet that's going to offset the decrease in respiratory rate. If, does that make sense? Because they're getting bigger volumes and pushing it out that way. That's our only saving grace at that point. Yeah. So match the um, CO2 prior to intubation with this. So if you have to put the respirate a third of it, mm -hmm. that's fine. <laughs> that's one more reason we want to check this stuff before we do, so we can we can yeah 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 yeah, yeah. 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 set it up for what they were pre intubation. So, um, do you guys have any qu other questions about alarms? What the heck? Those are horse lungs. Yeah. Lots and lots of peep. Lots of peep. That's pink and fluffy. That's 100% recruitment. Oh my gosh. So, 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 you know what I was talking about with the balloon, right? I would right? not have the size of our body. Plus, <laughs> lungs can expand. If you give them the space, they'll blow up. So, this is a people zero. So, this bag, this this bag, this lung, right? There's nothing left in there. Mm -hmm. So, if we bring that peep up. Oh, what See how it stays inflated? Uh -huh. Yeah. So, you're blowing up that balloon, but not letting all the air yeah. out. Yeah. So that's going to keep all those little alveoli splinted open okay. and give more opportunity for gas to go back and forth. Now, you take, say you, you take your patient to suction them, you know, um, and you pop it off, which is okay, you know, um, but then, you, you know, that peak goes back down to zero. So all those little alveoli that were splinted open go back down. So we want to keep, we want to keep those lungs a little bit inflated. Because it's not going to mess with the gas exchange. It's like whatever's still in there, I mean, it's going to go away. Yeah. Because you're going to, you know, it's, it's air. It's going to tumble around through all that stuff. So it, the, the CO2 will come out. We yeah. just want to keep everything open. Oh. Okay. If you don't have good peak when you're pre oxygenating or ventilating or anything like this, this gets like, a, you know, like the heel wash with the big size on the wash. Like that's what it gets. Like you want to have this good, nice heat on there. If you're having problems with your patient with like peep, with high peeps and things like that, there is functions you can do on the vet um, to make sure that you're not causing harm to yeah. your patient. Um, that's going to be an RT thing to do, but it's not bad to recommend. Um, I hold, E hold, and, and your pip, pips. Your I hold is going to check your lung compliancy. So if you're using lots and lots of peep or um, your tidal volume is really high, you really want to check an I hold. Um, and high peeps because that'll tell you what your lung compliancy is. Mm -hmm. And normally if those are above 30, you're losing lung compliancy. And then that's when you're risking your pneumos and barotraumas and things like that. So high peep, high tidal volume is a really risky thing basically. Yeah. 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 Okay. We can go to 15 before med direction, right? Yeah. yeah. And with these ARDS patients, mm -hmm. it's you're really high in your peeps because you're trying to get that capillary bed and mm -hmm. alveoli to connect. And so you just have crappy ventilator readings. Yep. The E hold is good because if your if your patient's auto peeping, like if if you're baggy, if you're not getting good lung compliancy and your alarms are sounding, you can do an E hold and see if they're breast stacking, and that's just as it sounds. Um, disconnect your vent, let it let them deflate a little bit, and then you sh your alarm should be reset for the time being. If you're having breast stacking, an intervention should be done on the ventilator not just constantly disconnecting the circuit and hooking it back up. Anything on that question? Nope. Yeah, the eye holds and knee holds uh, are all the, you know, that stuff. It's going to be, you know, more for the respiratory here, obviously, but kind of having a little bit of base knowledge on yeah. what they're doing. Um, you know, we can all, like, 
be a better better working team if we kind of know a little bit about what they've got going on. If you guys got questions? Come up and touch the vent. I know I when I was at so bedside, I was like, I don't want to touch it. Things you can do yeah. as your disciplines mm -hmm. to assist your patient is uh, sanctioning them mm -hmm. um, and sedating them and getting their pain under control appropriately. That's going to cause. That's going to really reduce the amount of things that this thing does and gets all angry and makes the room angry. Yeah. So if you can do that, um, that's going to really yeah. make it. Nine times out of ten, it's the sedation. Yeah, yep. it's, it's very, issue. very it's common. You know, and nine times out of ten, you get a high, like you might get a low pressure and you clear it, and you won't get that low pressure alarm again. But you, if you get a high pressure and you clear it, you're going to get that high pressure alarm again, probably, if you don't do some type of intervention. Yeah. yeah. It's always yeah. patients coughing, you know? Yeah. So. There's one more little thing on here. Let's see, this, this one, maybe this one might not have it. So, um, Really easy way to tell if your patient is not happy, other than looking at the monitor and saying they're tacky, their blood pressure's high. Mm -hmm. Look at the breath rate here. Okay. What it's at, and then what they're actually. Yeah, doing. if it's 12 here and it's 25 there, they're still over breathing the vent. You know, I like when those numbers are the same. Like yeah. I said, I want them out. Want out. Yeah, we don't do sedation vacations in the aircraft. Is that but leave that for the ICU. Is that something where SIMD versus the AC yes. setting will help? Yes, okay. that's what, yeah. So um, the SIMD mode, um, you know, that'll allow the patient, the, the ventilator will still do whatever it needs mm -hmm. to do, but if the, if the patient is a little under-sedated, if they want to take their own breath, and say you have this set for 400, but mm -hmm. they only want to take two, mm -hmm. the ventilator will say, oh, this is all you need? All right, I'm just going to support that breath a little bit, give you what you want, and once you start exhaling, I'm going to shut down. And then if you don't breathe, for a second or two, I'm going to give you another one. So that is more comfortable for patients who yeah. say they're a little understated, or for some reason we have orders to keep them at like, hey, their pressures are crazy soft. Like yeah. we want the this is the written orders from the sending facility that we're picking up from. We can say okay, so we put them in a mode of ventilation that's going to be more comfortable for them, mm -hmm. versus just the AC volume, which is a glorified BVM. It's like bam, yeah. 400, 400. You want you want to breathe? 400. We're not we're not stopping. <laughs> Uh, sometimes, it, even though your patient is taking breaths on their own, they won't get enough whatever's being delivered that their oxygen saturation won't respond to the SIMB mode, and so they will have to be in AC mm -hmm. um, and get that constant amount, okay. and that's not that uncommon either. Okay. So like if you've got somebody in SIMB, you've got an FiO2 of 100%, and you've done all these interventions, and they're not oxygenating well enough, switch over to AC, see if they do a little better. If they do worse, switch back to S I and B. Like there's no reason why you can't troubleshoot on that level <coughs> to get your patient more comfortable. Unless respiratory comes up and starts yelling at you. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> like, 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 I don't know how it felt like so. that. <laughs> I'm sure it's gonna fail. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> you know, teams that they come they, they pop off too. Yeah. You know, events yeah. are no, have some weight to them and you know when yeah. someone's know, you know, uh, sitting there, or, you know, the adapters come off three or four times, mm -hmm. and now the tube is wallowed out, so, you know, you get there, and they just, I mean, you look That's at it wrong, and it falls yeah. out. So. That's the one thing you know, <laughs> is how it's attached up, so that it yeah, fall out. Yeah, so. yeah, and they've got elbows and omniflex things and all that to kind of facilitate that, but. All right, you guys want to come up and look at it? I don't want to talk about it. Oh, geez, this is your safe <laughs> place. You can do it, Morgan. This is your safe <laughs> the alarm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Be able to oh, see yeah. the settings. All right. All right, so, so basically, hey. you just kind of hey. look across here. Oh, actually, um, I, I got to change the alarm parameters. Okay. There we go. Oh, you have to do the patient's going, <laughs> coughing, uh, and you're like, what's going on here? Okay, so I'm going to silence it. Yeah. And then I'm going to troubleshoot my patient. Yeah. And I'm going to make him more sedated so that we're not doing that again. Okay. Oh, it'll keep going until because I have the I have the uh, oh. high pressure alarm set so low oh, okay. that it's gonna. Go. So say you get so in there. So in real life, session, what what is that normally set? Um. <laughs> so. Oh, that's the alarm. The way we, the way we do this. Okay. So so this is this is our tidal volume, right? Okay. This is what our ventilator is giving. Mm -hmm, yeah. This is going to be minute volume. So okay. however, how you know, minute volume is just tidal volume multiplied by respiratory. Okay. So that's how much we're giving every minute. 
um, your I to E ratio, so that's you know how fast your breath is going in versus the um, ratio of um, how much exhalation time you have. And that's that's a different conversation, but that's what that all that is, is I to E ratio. Um, the calc that's um, uh, that's basically how much liter flow is going in every breath at the end of the circuit. There. That's that's a, you know more like on the um, pulmonology side. Pit. This is peak inspiratory pressure. So what this is is this is how much pressure in centimeters of water is getting received at this Y here, and this is where we set our high and low pressures. So if their PIP is 22, which is fine, um, so you know your RT will come in and she'll set the high pressure at you know usually like 10 above. So she'll set it at say, well let's say like let's say like 30. Right? So. There's that, and in the low pressure, we'll set that 10 below. So we'll set it at um, like 14. 10 above. 10 above, 10 below, and then the low minute volume is that um, that minute volume mm -hmm. here. We usually put that at about 50. Mm -hmm. And the reason we do that is we want to know if anything has changed here. And the cool mm -hmm. thing is now that you have your alarm settings, it's like, oh, it doesn't do anything. Usually, there's like a little orange bar here. Mm -hmm. It'll tell, tell you, you your is. your space here. So. Um, if, uh, if nothing's changed here, so say everything's rocking and rolling and you're good to go, everything's fine. Um, if, say for some reason um, there's a, vent, a circuit disconnect, mm -hmm. right? You're gonna get um, you're gonna get some alarms, things like that, um, and it's gonna say, yeah. So say the tooth automatically Whoops. low pressure <laughs> because there's no <laughs> there's there's no pressure yeah. going through that circuit now, right? Because there's no resistance because it's going out into the um, ambient uh, air. So it's going to keep doing this, but all you've done is silence it. You haven't cleared it, per okay. se. So, so if you hit it again, I this mean, little red light goes on. Now the red light went on. Then, okay. then it, it, it'll essentially right clear the alarm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if somebody's got a mucus plug or something mm -hmm. like that, or they're coughing, but your it. hips yeah. are not are, are set, you know, they're, it, it's going to be above this line here. Okay. So um, that's going to be uh, how you kind of get your alarm. Mm -hmm. gotcha. Now if you don't set your parameters, you don't know what's wrong. Yeah. So say for some reason you walk into the room and all these are cleared out and you're like, hey, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. It happens. I've done it myself. You know, mm -hmm. we're 20 minutes into a flight. I'm like, oh, I've got to see my alarm <laughs> So you don't know if you're giving someone a you know, new or something like yeah. that but because there's no frame of reference. So if you guys walk in and um, you see that, that means there's no alarms yeah. set here. So, and it's just one of those like gee whizzy things where you just happen to look over and you're like, hey, hey, whoever you're got to say, hey, I happened to notice when I was doing my assessment, did you guys, did you set the alarm for hours? And they can give you a hard time. You're like, no, we Tell don't want those alarms going off. <laughs> no, but my wife's an too, so I can make fun. Okay. <laughs> um, but it's okay, it, it happens. Uh, so that's how you're gonna get that. Um, so uh, silence reset, it mm -hmm. says do not silence, but you need to see what's going on. And it's gonna tell you what's going on. Yeah. So if it's a low pressure, like you saw there, mm -hmm. um, there's some sort of, there's some airs going where it shouldn't be, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so disconnect, that's what that is. Oh, so, I was but it like, should be, disconnect? it should be saying low pressure, because that's the low pressure side. That's interesting, because I haven't used an LTV 12 in a while. Uh, so, um, <laughs> but if it's a disconnect, that's going to say the same thing. So I guess, so, for, so I guess if, at least we know if it's, if it's low pressure from here or disconnect, it's yeah. here side, yeah. not patient side. No, no, yeah. it's, it, it, had it, it said it down there, too. No, it's, it's it's said low, it said low pressure. Oh, it did say low pressure. Yeah. So low oh, you're right, yeah. We'll know what's up here if it's the disc. Yeah. No alarms okay. on right now. Oh, it's cause, is it because we don't have any alarm settings to it? That's weird. It's not even ventilating. Well, that would be a while. Could we, we break notice. it? <laughs> oh, mate. Let me do a manual. Right? That's weird. Hmm. Go um, ahead that back up. That's weird. It shouldn't just stop ventilating like that. It wouldn't even let me do a manual. Right? Well, I could still feel oh. breath coming oh, through it. I, I could still feel air coming through it. So, yeah, it's still ventilating. That's it's just not. The, so, what that is, that little bit of air there, mm -hmm. that's just movement to keep air in the circuit. So, that's going to be that, uh, that leader flow. Come on. There it goes. Huh. Well, that's that's odd, because it did do the low pressure yeah, at first. Yeah, it did before, right. but that's when you had the alarm. Yeah, let me make sure so. everything's connected, snug up here. All right, try it. Let's see if you can 
get an alarm. Yeah, it just shuts right off. Did you set them again? What's no, that? they're not set. The alarms aren't alarms? set. Yeah, no, it's yeah, it's it's been cleared. But did you reset the alarms? Parameters. Oh, <laughs> that's why. <laughs> See, Tina, that's why you get paid the big bucks. That's why I wasn't in it, because there was no alarm to trigger. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Now we have all the issues happening. Uh, what? Oh, man. There we go. Swamp All right. Okay, so now you have some alarm. Thank you. So now take it off. Okay, now low pressure. Okay. That's scary though, because if you don't have your alarm settings, then basically you couldn't be getting any ventilation and nothing. I mean, after a little while, the sats will drop. That's we'll a little long. Yeah. Yeah. But it's we'll just alarm scary. Eventually. I bet it's scary though yeah. that they could be sitting like that for a while. Well, long. that's yeah. the, that's the yeah. you know big thing is you know we have all these cool tools and stuff, but if we don't use them right, then we can, we can cause harm to our patients. Yeah. You know that's why we double check our meds. You know, mm -hmm. med errors happen all the time. You know, people. Um, you know, they, they, they do this stuff all the time to, to, to you know, cause problems and nobody wants to harm anybody, but, um, now we got a little bit there. Yeah. Yeah. So if this were a BBM, this is how fast you're squeezing, mm -hmm. or yeah. how many times a minute you're squeezing, yeah. this is the volume, and this is how fast you're giving it, and then this is your flow here. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're trying to get it changed in our protocols to where we just have pediatric PDMs only. 